And I'm now uh, happy to turn to Co-Chair Smith for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, Co-Chair. Uh, the topic of today's hearing is one which should garner support on both sides of the aisle. The importance of judicial independence indeed is a matter of general principle embedded among larger principles, namely respect for constitutionalism and the separation of power, support is widespread. So too, so too for related principles such as fighting corruption and promoting the rule of law. As one of our witnesses, Eric Olson said, fighting corruption and promoting the rule of law is not a left wing or right wing agenda. Problem of course is when the principle is distorted to fit an ideological agenda, when for example, so-called anti-corruption campaigns are applied not in an even-handed manner, but rather as a partisan and ideological tool against one side to advance the interests of the other. The countries of Central America are varied, as we all know, and each is faced with unique problems. Some concerns remain constant, however, such as endemic corruption, social and economic inequality, and ideological polarization. The status of an independent judiciary, likewise, varies from country to country, though there are some troubling trends in the region. In El, in El Salvador, the president has appeared to be moved in a high-handed manner, removing and replacing judges from the constitutional chamber with the support of the National Assembly, where he holds a supermajority. The question with respect to El Salvador, which I would like to hear answered by our panelists, is whether he did so in defiance of the Constitution. In Nicaragua, we see a judiciary which has become an appendage of the authoritarian, authoritarian Ortega regime, too often rubber stamping prosecutorial abuses. Indeed, just yesterday, Nicaragua opposition leader Felix Maradiega was arrested and beaten with his family and supporters questioning where he is being detained. The judicial system has become politicized with judges and magistrates beholding to their Ortega's Sandinista's Le National Liberation Front. <clears throat> Pardon me. Jared Genser, an international human rights lawyer with special expertise in arbitrary detention, has worked on more than 50 political prisoner cases over his career and is the author of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Submitted testimony that is hearing and said, and I quote in part, just yesterday, my pro bono client, Felix Maridiega, a prominent Nicaraguan activist and presidential candidate was beaten, detained, and disappeared by Nicaraguan security forces. In recent weeks, Ortega uh, has transparently and brazenly decapitated and politicized the opposition by disqualifying all of the leading candidates most likely to prevail in the opposition's presidential primary vote on August uh, 2nd, 2021, including Christiana Chamorro, Arturo Cruz, and Felix. He goes on to say in Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega has completely co-opted the justice system to serve his own interests and consolidate his autocratic rule in the country. Currently, there are more than 120 political prisoners in the country detained on pretextual charges. Judges in Nicaragua often try to provide these detentions with the patina of legitimacy by going through the motions to make what are clearly political show trials appear real, but few are fooled. He goes on and completes uh, his testimony, Ortega has shamelessly exploited Nicaragua's judicial system to eliminate systematically any challenges to his authority. The international community must unequivocally condemn this assault on Nicaragua's democracy and it must work urgently to restore and fortify judicial independence and the rule of law in Nicaragua and Central America. It is perhaps Guatemala, however, that has received the most attention of late, given the recent visit by Vice President uh, Kamala Harris uh, to the country. My colleague and co-chair Jim McGovern and I agree on a lot of things. We have stood shoulder to shoulder on combating the deprecations of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, for example, which I greatly appreciate. And I think we would both agree that the independence of the judiciary under, is under serious attack in Guatemala. Where I think we disagree, however, is where the attack against the independence of Guatemala's judiciary is coming from. I believe an honest examination of the record would reveal that it has come in part from the United States, including under two former ambassadors. Todd Robinson in particular, who has aligned himself with uh, left-wing political actors in the country and abroad, has also come from an activist out of control, UN agency, CSIG, funded in part by the United States, which was the subject of a Helsinki Commission hearing, which I chaired, that examined the role played by CSIG and Russian state actors, principally 
VTB Bank, sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury Department, and intervening in Guatemala's legal system and persecuting a Russian family, the Bitkovs, who have fled the long arm of Vladimir Putin. Human rights champion Bill Browder, the man who tenaciously and brilliantly led the campaign for the enactment of the Magnitsky Act and Global Magnitsky, after the government of Russia arrested, tortured, and killed his lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, in November of 2009, has championed the Bitkov's case. Mr. Browder testified at my April 27th hearing uh, in 2018 on their behalf and said, in part, inexplicably, VTB Bank gained the legal status as an interested party in the migration case against the Bitkovs with the support of CSIG. In January 2015, a criminal case against the Bitkovs was opened at the direction of CSIG, says Bill Browder. Immediately after that, he testified that, quote, 70 armed police officers raided the Bitkovs' home, arrested Arena, Igor, and Anastasia, and detained them in cages behind the parking garage in the main court building in Guatemala City. The Bitkov should have been granted asylum, not prison. An earlier appeals court ruling ruled that the Bitkov's uh, offense was perhaps only administrative in nature and punishable with a fine. Yet Igor was sentenced to 19 years in prison and Irina and Anastasia was, were sentenced to 14 years each. We will hear from one of the Bitkov's arena as a witness uh, today. Indeed, this strange alliance between ceasing and the Russian actors and the role played by key left-wing political figures such as attorney Alfonso Carrillo in mediating this alliance met with what I can best describe as incuriosity by former Ambassador Robinson, who has been nominated by President Biden to serve as the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs at State. I hope that my Senate colleagues inquire at confirmation as to the reasons for this incuriosity, if that's what it was, by Ambassador Robinson with respect to Russia's role with CSIG and also Russian influence on Guatemala's constitutional court, whose composition was heavily influenced by Mr. Robinson. In that regard, I commend a column from the always excellent Mary Anastasia O'Grady, published this week in the Wall Street Journal, where she states, and I quote, Mr. Robinson's record raises serious questions about his suitability for the job as head of INL. As she points out, as ambassador, Mr. Robinson, quote, earned a reputation for meddling in domestic politics in ways that went well beyond the scope of his responsibility. He was, was known, for example, for pressuring Guatemala's Congress to confirm judges aligned with his political views. I ask that Ms. O'Grady's article, as well as a series of articles, again, I'll be entered into the record and commend them to my Senate colleagues as they consider Ambassador Robinson's nomination. I also commend an excellent statement of the record submitted by Stephen Hecht on impunity of uh, impunity observer, which elaborates on Todd Robinson's intervention with respect to the composition of Guatemala's constitutional court, in particular with regards to the appointment of former Justice Gloria Porras. And here I must remind this panel that the principle of independence of the judiciary resides within the context of larger principles, namely the importance of constitutionalism and respect for the separation of powers. One cannot, in the name of safeguarding the independence of the judiciary, allow a handful of judges to run roughshod over their constitution and violate the separation of powers. Yet as amply demonstrated by, by Mr. Hecht, uh, what the constitutional court did under Gloria Porras, where he describes as twice participated in a ruling that stopped Congress from processing cases against her. It is worth noting that prior to her visit to Guatemala, Vice President Harris met quite publicly with both Gloria Porras and Thelma Aldana, uh, the former Attorney General of Guatemala in the United States. Indeed, the reason that meeting was held in the United States and not Guatemala might be because Thelma uh, had two outstanding arrest warrants in Guatemala on charges of corruption. This is another area of inquiry for the Senate with respect to Ambassador Robinson. When it appears for, when he appears for confirmation, what was his role in protecting and promoting Thelma Aldana? At our Helsinki hearing, we received testimony that a former Guatemalan uh, official named Myra Veliz was at the heart of a passport and fraudulent document ring. There was incredible allegations of army corruption of RENAP, R-E-N-A-P. Yet instead of investigating her 
Thelma uh, Aldana gave Velez a position in the Attorney General's office and protected her. Indeed, we saw the prosecution of low-ranking functionaries by Aldana and CSIG and the disproportionate harassment of the Bitkovs who received documents after entrusting the Cutino law firm, another politically connected actor was, uh, was someone who somehow escaped the scrutiny of Aldana. Thus, I think another line of inquiry for Ambassador Robinson would be the extent of his awareness of Thelma Aldana's role in failing to investigate those officials, such as Myra Veliz, allegedly involved in the distribution of fraudulent documents to foreign nationals. And what were the national security implications to the United States of this apparent, apparent incuriosity? To make a final point and what alarms me, and I believe colleagues such as Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Roger Wicker, who have criticized the intervention of actors such as CSIG and Russia in the workings of the Guatemalan judicial system, are the double standards. Of course, we are against corruption and efforts to undermine the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. But what is so infuriating is that these important principles are so often applied in a one-sided manner and used to advance the interests of the political left. If we are going to fight corruption and defend the rule of law in countries such as Guatemala, it is important that we do so in an even-handed and fair manner, tackling wrongdoing by both political right and political left with consistency, predictability, and commitment. I thank you, and I yield back uh, to my good friend and colleague. Yeah. Irina, Irina Bikova. I'm here. It is a great honor to have your attention, and our family is very grateful for this. I will go straight to the core of the problem. As you might know, our family has been politically persecuted by Kremlin for over a decade now. We still find ourselves in a perilous situation. In the, in the 1990s, Igor and I, well, we founded a successful pulp and paper company in Russia called Northwest Timber Company. It was valued at nearly half a billion dollars. That's when the problems started. I should. I'm, 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 I'm. Can you Do can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Ah, okay. One of the Putin's bankers just asked to sell 51% of the business for $25 million. We refused. I was asked to become a representative of Putin's political party in Moscow. I refused. Consequently, our daughter, when seven, a 16 year old, was kidnapped and raped for three years on the orders of Kremlin. And this traumatic event provoked a number of grave illnesses in Anastasia. Up to this day, she needs constant treatment and medicine. Our story has many similarities to that of Bill Browder. First, Russian officials steal everything from us when they accuse us of theft. And uh, we came to Guatemala to escape persecution, but the Kremlin caught up with us and used its influence to encourage Guatemalan prosecutors, judges, and even magistrates to fabricate a case against our family. We had a local law firm, Putino International, that offered citizenship services and governmental protection, they told us the process was completely legal. Thousands of foreign citizens acquired Guatemalan passports in this way, but we were the only ones to face criminal prosecution. We were considered part of a criminal group issuing passports and tried with a group of low-level officials. My husband received a 90-year jail sentence for passport violation, my daughter and I 14 years each. 
we people who authorized and signed our documents, including the former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Vice President of Migration Office, Myra Bellis, were never investigated. Russian officials have been involved in our case since 2013, when the now sanctioned Russian state bank, VTB, presented a complaint against our family. The complaint did not proceed of the lack of evidence. However, uh, until CSIC got involved. In 2014, the president of VTB Bank, Andrei Kostin, signed a power of attorney to Henry Conte, who is a magistrate of Constitutional Court of Guatemala, while the president of another sanctioned entity, Gazprom Bank, Andrei Akimov, signed a power of attorney to Guatemalan lawyer Alfonso Carrillo, who is a close friend of the head of CC, Ivan Velasquez. On 3rd of November 2014, Ivan Velasquez personally asked Attorney General Telma Aldana to merge the complaint of VTB Bank with a human trafficking case known as the immigration case, as well to assign the case to a particular prosecutor of FESI, Stuardo Campo. Right afterward, our family was arrested and imprisoned while our three-year-old son was sent to an orphanage. My daughter and where, where and when our son was abused physically and psychologically. My daughter and I spent a year and a half in preventive prison and my husband three and a half years. Meanwhile, the fabricated case against us proceeded. There was a complete lack of evidence, but that did not matter to the prosecutors or judges. At the request of CSIC, VTB Bank was named as co-plaintiff in the immigration case against us. The formal accusation was that there were anomalies in the official documents issued to us by the Guatemalan government. In February 2015, the Russian Ministry of Interior Affairs sent a request for mutual legal assistance on our case to Guatemalan authorities. Guatemala and Russia do not have an agreement of mutual legal assistance. Nevertheless, the Guatemalan authorities cooperated. On 5th of October, Three months before the trial began, Judge Erika Aifan sent a letter to Russian embassy indicating the jail sentences that we will receive. Constitutional Court and Court of Appeals issued us constitutional protection twice, stating that no crime was committed. Yet, they still permitted the judges to sentence us. This abuse were committed under the former president of the Constitutional Court, Gloria Porras. During the imprisonment, my husband was tortured by judge, judges Erika Aifan and Jasmine Barrios, who later were found guilty of torture by the National Commission of Prevention of Torture we presented an appeal of prejudice to the Supreme Court of Justice against these two judges. However, it was declined on the grounds that the appeal was presented out of vengeance. Meanwhile, in Russia, VTB Bank made numerous statements recognizing the role of CSIC in imprisoning our family. While state channel, channels called our imprisonment a victory of Russian intelligence services. In prison, my daughter and I were asked to testify against my husband, Igor. The questions were sent 
by the public ministry on behalf of the Russian Attorney General. Right now we are all the under how we, right now we are all under house arrest and can be sent back to prison to any moment. The Court of Appeals last year confirmed the absurd sentences of 40 years for me and my daughter. My husband was notified yesterday after uh, a retrial that Court of Appeals not only confirmed his sentences, but augmented it, adding two years of prison more, as was asked by the public ministry. The miscarriage of justice by the Guatemalan judicial body was committed not only in our case, but in many others as well. The most outrageous ones are Odebrecht, Sigma, and Bantrap case. Odebrecht and Sigma, with help of Guatemalan officials, stole $650 million from Guatemalan budget. Bantrap is about laundering of Nicolas Maduro regime money from Guatemalan bank Bantrap. Cecit covered up, covered it up by imprisoning scapegoats while protecting the real criminals. I can offer additional information later if necessary. Honorable members of the Lantus Human Rights Commission, I ask you to please look into these unthinkable abuses committed openly by the Guatemalan judicial system. We are in legal limbo. We are under house arrest and have no documents and no ability to work and earn a living. It is incomprehensible to me how Guatemalan and Russian officials would want to torture my children. I cannot describe to you what we have been through. Our nightmare is still not over. We are only alive thanks to the intervention of Bill Browder who took a personal interest in our case and brought, brought it to the Helsinki Commission and to the US Congress. We have learned that as enemies of the Russian state, we cannot possibly assert our rights in Guatemala. Thank you um, very much. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for their testimony. I'd like to, uh, Irina uh, Bikova, your statement was very powerful. Um, we ought to, all of us, be calling for justice for the Bitcoffs. And I find it appalling that there are too many people who look askance, uh, too many people who think that, um, you know, what you have been through, which is one of the gross miscarriages of justice I have ever seen. You know, I work on political prisoners for 41 years. And I can tell you, uh, your case is right at the top when the bank and the kleptocracy of Vladimir Putin follows you, first steals your, your assets, your bank, I mean, your, uh, your, uh, uh, your company, then follows you, your daughter is, is raped, then follows you as you go to Latvia, then you went to Turkey, and then thought you had found a safe haven in Guatemala, only to be tracked down five years later uh, by the Russians. They have very good intelligence. And it, it, it's beguiling to me as to why CSIG wanted to become a partner with Putin. That question has never been answered. Why did they merge your case with a human trafficking case? I wrote our law on human trafficking called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. I take a backseat to no one in combating sex and labor trafficking. It's one of the most horrible offenses on the face of the earth, modern day slavery. To take a case where you got documents to protect yourself, almost like a witness protection uh, mode, so that they wouldn't find you in order to get into Guatemala. You knew that they didn't have an extradition uh, agreement with the Russians, so you knew it was a safer place than you thought to be. And then, as you pointed out in your testimony on November 3rd, uh, 2014, Ivan Velasquez personally asked the general prosecutor, Thelma Adelana, to merge the complaint in the VTB bank 
with a human trafficking case known as the migration case and to assign a particular prosecutor. Right after that, you point out your husband, daughter, and you uh, were arrested and imprisoned while your three-year-old son was sent to an orphanage. That is an outrage. And we all should be calling for justice for the Bitcoffs and doing it aggressively. I was surprised some people who followed your testimony never even referenced back to it. You are, you are persecuted by the long arm of the Russian um, uh, government, Vladimir Putin and his banks. As, as Bill Browder pointed out, Gazprom Bank got involved as well as did other Russian banks because they wanted to send a message to anyone if they don't agree to just forfeiting their assets to this kleptocracy, they'll follow you anywhere you go, anywhere in the world. So you're being made an example of by the Putin uh, dictatorship. And I would hope that more members would be calling for your, we've never gotten a, an accounting from uh, CSIG on this. I would love to have them come and testify. I have 30 questions I'd like to ask them uh, in order to get to the record and get this straightened out. And you are owed a very, very serious apology uh, by this whole process by the enablers, wittingly or unwittingly, who look askance towards your case. When I held that hearing back in April of 2018, there were people who were trying to stop that hearing. Bill Browder, you pointed out, has been a champion for your case, as he was in after he was killed for Sergei Magnitsky uh, in terms of bringing to light uh, the dishonor of the Russian government, and now by by working with them and partnering with them, uh, the Guatemalans as well as CSIG. So, I, Mr. Chairman, let's invite um, Velasquez to come and, and, and testify. I want to ask some real questions of him, uh, and I'll do it too. I, I'll call the hearing. Secondly, I just want to say about judiciaries, very briefly, and Ron, you might want to just say a brief word. But you know, all judiciaries have some level of politicization. Our own does. I mean, even now there's very serious talk about packing our court because that's all about what are the outcomes when it comes to policy decisions. Uh, if there is corruption, uh, thankfully we have a very vigorous justice department that hopefully would go after that. But you know, in many cases, courts have become uh, super legislatures, having the last word on legislation. Uh, so the packing of the court, uh, and we know in every presidential election, uh, the issue of who goes on the courts in the United States is always a huge issue, especially for the United States uh, Supreme Court. So uh, I just want to, you know, we've got to be very, but again, countenancing no corruption uh, and, and the rules need to be followed. So we need to continue to rededicate ourselves uh, to that. So um, I, I run a view to when I have the, the last word on this, I would like to yield to you. But again, I thank you for your courage and what you and your husband and family have been through. Remember, and I think most members may not know this, but they were on a, on a tear, frankly, to take your son who was born in Guatemala and send him back to Russia, to an orphanage there. Uh, thankfully, your lawyers and you and your husband were able to, to stop that. Um, and getting him back, had they uh, deported him like that, uh, probably would have never happened and you would have not seen your son again. One injustice after another. CSIG should have been on the side and the Guatemalan uh, court of protection you are an asylum seeker, and you should have gotten the asylum and the protection you deserve. Irina? Uh, Agrum, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Christopher Smith. I am very grateful to you for your support, for your courage. My daughter me, help me to translate. Смотри, что, эм, что, что я была шокирована, как э, большинством выступающих вообще была проигнорирована наша трагедия. Они как ни в чем не бывало поддерживали Айфана, говорили хорошо. Я услышала много о том, что если кто-то что-то сказал, это значит на суде и на сесик наговаривают. У меня под каждым моим словом есть a long time. Я У меня все прописано, а я от них, кроме слов, честно, yeah, хорошая, справедливая, вообще ничего не слышала. And my mother wants to say that we have evidence 
and each single word that we said, we have evidence for every single word, physical evidence. However, she can see that other witnesses who are saying that, uh, or accusing us of hearsay, they do not have evidence. So there are a lot of people who are saying that, oh, somebody is brave and somebody is a champion of justice, but there is no evidence of that. While we do have evidence and we have submitted it before the hearing, so it can be seen. Да, и единственное человеческое участие, которое я здесь вижу, это только Кристофера Смита. And my mother is saying, uh, and I read, that the only human uh, response that we can see here is yours, Mr. Smith. And thank you very much for, thank you very for much. paying attention. Okay, thank you very much. And I just would mention, I would ask you, consent, Mr. Chairman, that we include um, uh, statements from... Um, uh, Calderon, an attorney, Rafael Estrada, Steve Hecht, and Jared Gesser. Gesser get, uh, and, and I just would say uh, what I think will be the next speaker, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, was at our hearing, you might recall, Arena, uh, and was very eloquent in her defense of you uh, at that hearing as well. So uh, I thank you. And there are many friends here, Marco Rubio, for example, and I and many others, uh, Senator Wicker, who cared deeply about your family, and we're not going to give up on this. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Buffett, a tip of the iceberg. So if there's corruption against the Bitcoffs, uh, there is very likely corruption at a whole other lot of levels. And I've always been worried about accountability, especially for those. I mean, I asked Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, about the Bitcoffs in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him. And he said he has no accountability. First, he didn't know much about the case, and I could understand that, or, or CSIG itself. Uh, but then he did say, and we did follow up with him, uh, that where is the accountability? Who actually oversees the people who are, uh, to make sure that absolutely is, every, everything is fair uh, and there's no, no, uh, you know, the prosecutorial discretion has no other agenda. It's just, you go after the bad guys and the bad uh, players. Thank you.